Hey. Welcome to the sixth episode of I'm in the Band, a podcast hosted by me, Allison Wolf. Every month, I'll be talking with different punk musicians and artists, door kicking, ceiling smashing people who've made their art their way. In this episode, we're continuing with the British post punk band The Raincoats. Last episode, I spoke with Anna Da Silva. This time, I talked to bassist, vocalist, and Raincoats co founder Gina Birch. Oh, Gina and Anna met in art school and formed the Raincoats in the early days of London punk and made four albums before breaking up in 1984. Afterward, Gina formed another band called Dorothy with Raincoats violinist Vicky Aspinall. But Gina also makes films, like this one that she made in art school, where a woman just screams. She later went to film school and pursued a career making indie films and music videos. The Raincoats still perform off and on, like a recent event at The Kitchen in New York. I was lucky to hang out at the rehearsal beforehand. I interviewed Gina the next day in her hotel room, where she talked about her art school antics, seeing the first Sex Pistols and Slit shows, and about being a special baby. I was uh, the first British baby to survive three blood transfusions. And my mum always said I was born yellow. But when I spoke to her the other day, she said, no, you were born blue. And so I said, well, I was born green, you know, so a bit of yellow, a bit of blue. (laughs) My name's Gina, Gina Birch. And you might know me from a band called The Raincoats. I'm always doing all sorts of different projects, but for the last four years I've been painting. I am going to, instead of writing an autobiography, to paint my life. I had this desire to uh, be in a band, and um, I ran into a guitar shop and bought a bass without trying it because I didn't know how to play it and you know those shops were full of guys who liked to show off to each other about how brilliant they were so you felt two inches tall if you didn't know what you were doing and so I just grabbed this bass and ran out. So when Anna came back after her holiday in Madeira we got together and we wrote a few songs. We decided we would let sounds that were in our bodies and our psyche just come out. And sometimes you feel a bit embarrassed. What will the engineer think when I'm going, yeah, 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 yeah. And then, you know, things kind of work on them and then you put a sound on them and an echo and a reverb and a this and you go back, oh, I think I'll do that again. And it's building a confidence and a trust. We kind of learnt together and we played together and we listened to each other and each of us would try and get some of our personality or our heart into our way of playing and we would blend them together. There was Palmolive and Anna who are, you know, Portuguese and Spanish and me and Vicky. Vicky's more... um, English than I am and I I, you know I think I was pretty crazy and you know and people would be laughing at me because I'm silly as the youngest child there was me and my older brother and I was you know I was the silly girl and I still, you know, it's like, it's awful that you can, you, you carry that with you. I was just hearing someone the other day saying, you know, I'm every age I've ever been. 
And I think, you know, there is a bit of you that's five, seven, nine, eleven. You've got all those bits in you. And, and the bits that have gone, you know, you're a silly girl, are still there to cramp your style. I've heard you say that you were pretty rebellious, like a rebellious youth, and maybe that led to you being punk. I was wondering if you could go back and talk a bit about your upbringing or childhood and sort of how you were rebelling in your earliest stages. Yeah, I was, uh, you know, w- w- as soon as I had a bit of independence, I was attracted to a kind of uh, uh, the townies, the low life, the <laughs> the druggies. There was like guys who'd come back from uh, San Francisco who had plaits and long garb and uh, that people taking LSD and then there were the kind of northern soul speed freaks and uh, each little culture kind of revolved around a certain type of drug you know and uh, it was all very exciting I thought this was kind of something so beautiful and incredible of course it, it really wasn't that beautiful and incredible because I know you know the damage drugs can do but I had a I did have a strong attraction to it and um, all those things like drugs and alcohol I was incredibly shy but when I kind of experimented with things I realized I could be someone else I could kind of begin to step into my own shoes and so it was very useful in that way. I mean, it also was damaging because I think, you know, I, I, my education suffered and um, probably my brain cells suffered too. <laughs> um, but it was something really important to me, you know, that kind of breaking with the kind of very straight, forward, nine to five, everything in place, almost perhaps stemming from fear of the fear of the unknown. Well, I didn't have fear of the unknown because I was fearful of the confines of the norm. So I reacted completely differently from my parents. And I, I just wanted to jump off as many cliffs as possible and see if I could fly. And sometimes I did. <laughs> One thing I, I did notice just from reading the book by Jen Pelly is that your first show was on November 9th in, I think, 1977. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about the first show? That's my birthday, by the way. Ah, fantastic. Well, we were coerced into doing it. And we were like, but we, we don't know how to play. We don't know what we're doing. We've never done this before. We've only been playing our instruments a few weeks. And he said, no, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. And so knowing it wouldn't be that fine, <laughs> and it was very exciting. But, you know, I w- was terrified and... Um, I had I had the song No One's Little Girl. Anna's got the cassette of it somewhere. And I I, um, I did sing No One's Little Girl. I can't quite remember what songs we did. But I think we did about five songs and probably looked really freaked out. So it was kind of crazy. And I remember my tutor from Hornsey coming and uh, he kind of basically said, don't give up the day job, you know. <laughs> the, you know, the, the college... The college wasn't that impressed with what, you know, they didn't get punk, really. And I think they missed a trick, as we say, you know, that they they really didn't recognise the the strength and importance of it. And I know that you do visual art or performance art. I don't know which came first in your life, visual art or music or... Well, for me, at school, I I was good at painting and that's what we did really Uh, we were taught about you know that probably the impressionists were the last you know the most modern of art history that we got to but as I got to art school you know I discovered all these other things of land art and performance art and um, conceptual art you know when you have an idea for something the idea is often so perfect and wonderful And so conceptual art was often, you didn't actually have to do it because actually doing it might spoil it. But so conceptual art had this wonderful purity that I I thought was fascinating. I remember one time when I visited London and saw Anna and Shirley and Anna told me about the bra burning film. And I was, I don't know, I've just been fascinated with that forever. And recently I started doing a DJ night where I play all female punk music and we're calling it bra burn. 
Brilliant. Because <laughs> I told my uh, DJ partner, I was like, I think that Gina Birch made a bra burning video. We should call it bra burn. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, that was um, that was probably about ten years ago. I did that, and I I I um I called it um, fake seventies feminist films. <laughs> And my kids were at school then, at primary school, and um, so I put out the word to all the mums, if any of you have got any old bras, please bring them to give them to me because I'm going to do a bra burning ceremony. And so I got inundated with a huge number of bras, and uh, so I decided I'd put them on this line. Unfortunately, I soaked them in paraffin, and the, and they became so heavy that as I set fire to them, just I was in this field, and then the the line broke, and so that's why it goes from setting fire to them to them burning on the ground. So it was a bit of a disaster, but you know, out of it is what it is. It's amazing. So I know. And by the way, I like wearing a bra myself. I just thought it was, you know, the absurdity of what feminism was thought to be about, you know, hairy legs, hairy armpits, dirty women who, you know, want to kill men and they want to burn their bras and all this nonsense, really. And uh, so I I just thought it was quite funny to to, to have this idea of burning bras. And because it kind of represents something quite powerful and rebellious. But at the same time, you know, if you've got boobs or breasts, you know, you, you know, it's quite it's quite uncomfortable running without a bra or I mean, a sports bra or whatever. You want to you want to give them some support. And uh, so who invented the? I don't know. <laughs> well, my mother was a total nudist. So, oh, was um, she? yeah. So I think she never had a bra. She didn't wear underwear either. But did she have um, did her, her boobs kind of? support themselves or were they always flopping I guess they around? weren't big they weren't too big yeah that's probably part of it I don't know so I noticed that several people in London who are in the punk scene like Viv Albertine and I think someone from the clash and you and also Anna De Silva were all in art school and then kind of transitioned into punk and that seems unique to me I mean I don't know a lot of people from my scene who were in art school who became punks so I was kind of wondering what was that transition or transformation well there were lots actually I mean you know I think uh, Mick Jones and uh, Paul Simonon were art school from The Clash yeah Viv Albertine me and Anna and yeah lots of people um and Adamant. Adamant was at the same art school as us. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, I don't know what it's about. It's about the idea that one has um, freedom to do what, what you like. Because at that time in art school in the 70s, you didn't have to go as a painter or as a sculptor or as a printmaker or as a um, you know life drawer. There was a lot of fluidity and as I say you know if if digging a hole or uh, jumping through a giant sheet of paper or putting long uh, material into rivers was art and acceptable then one's state of mind was such that it could be in this other exciting sphere which happened to be music there was this as I say this incredible kind of vibration of excitement around punk and I think people who who felt it were so drawn to it that their other art practice kind of fell by the wayside were you at the first Sex Pistols show I was I was (laughs) yes and we didn't really know what it was um but we went and these four guys were on this little stage but we saw these guys, they played four or five songs and then they were gone. And they were kind of shambolic and energized and weird. And we just thought they were the most amazing thing. But we, had, we, we still didn't know what they were called. But when we went back to Nottingham, we were out and about at times. And one of the boys from Nottingham who had, was in London already went, Oh, you're Sex Pistols fans, aren't you? And we were like, what? And they were like, yeah, you're Sex Pistols fans. And we were like, then we discovered that was the name of the band that we'd seen that had really blown us away. So when I did come back to London, I knew I was a Sex Pistols fan. And uh, I, so I came in September 76 to London and it had transpired that this band that we'd seen had become part of a phenomenon. And uh, and it really was a very, very exciting time. 
you know, the, the clash was there and the subway sect and the buzzcocks and the prefects. And then not that long after the slits formed. And how about the slits? Were you at the slits first show? How did the slits have any influence um, on well, you guys? I knew a lot about the slits and I was definitely at their first show right at the front. Um, the first show completely had me in raptures. You know, I just thought it was the most incredible thing. And that idea that it was something that I'd never thought of before. I had never, ever, I'd seen all these bands, the Sex Pistols, the Clash, the Buzzcocks, the Subway Sect, and thought they were all amazing. But I never, ever thought it was something for girls, for women. Right? I, you know, it seems bizarre now how that kind of gender thing was so... Uh, strictly enforced you know so seeing them and seeing their chaos and energy and the fact that the songs they spoke to me it wasn't speaking to my boyfriend <laughs> about me or you know it wasn't it wasn't the lay lady lay lay across my big brass bed it was uh, it was songs to me you know it was songs about me it was so thrilling and to see these girls tripping over, messing about, but just emoting with such force, energy and dynamism, it just opened the floodgates in my mind. And I thought, this is crazy. I so wish I was there in that band doing this. I want to be there. I really want to be there doing this. Listening to your songs, the musicality of it, it's really, sometimes really abstract and really interesting and just the way that each of you play and create songs together is so unique. I, I really have never heard anything else like that. And it's also been really inspirational to a lot of uh, women in music and people in music who have followed. And I just wondered if there's something about you or each of you or maybe about your skill level or just your art background or something that brought you to the style that you guys created? Because you really created your own thing. We weren't always trying to make a, a three chord thrash. And if we did do a three chord thrash, we'd try and make it something that was unlike another one, you know, to not do dum, 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 dum. And I have nothing against those kind of, you know, uh, rock and roll bass lines. They're lovely. If I were to say my influences, it would be a reggae bass lines, partly because I love the deepness of it. I love the melodies of it. And I love the way that they rhythmically work. And I love the space around the notes in, in reggae bass lines. So that was always something that interested and inspired me. And I think a lot of times when people are talking about women in punk, the narrative can be that like, oh, because of their skills or lack of skills, this is what they bring to the table or this is why the music is different or something. But I, I feel like when I listen to you guys, it's very intentionally feminist, but also introspective about telling stories of women's lives. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, Anna had studied languages for five years and li literature she studied literature, so she had a much a very strong grasp on poetry and expressing through words. Me, not at all, you know. So mine are very minimal in 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 ways, but I brought something different, and and they are both a language that comes from our own bodies, you know, and. Vicky as well, because she had been involved politically with a feminist ideology brought that with her and as you heard from Palm Olive that she wrote four songs in the slits which I don't think the slits film really um highlights enough she wrote shoplifting which is amazing do a runner do a runner and uh you know I remember so well her having to do a runner <laughs> She had holes in her raincoat pocket, but she was so charming that she, they never, they never did anything bad to her. 
Uh, but we were all living on no money at the time. Um, she wrote Newtown and FM. And then she wrote Adventures Close to Home, which um, is her most poetic of those songs. And that's when she was leaving the Slits, or the Slits felt that she was getting too apart from their ideology. Imagine writing these amazing songs and then getting thrown out of the band and then the band still does your songs. That's weird, a band you've started. Boy, oh boy. Anyway, it was all <laughs> great for us because we inherited Palmolive and Adventures Close to Home. I'm surprised y'all didn't do the other songs. Did you consider doing shoplifting? Or never, never, FM? never. No, I mean, I was so in awe of the slits. It was ridiculous. So even when the first time I tried to sing Adventures, I didn't realize Tessa was singing it. But I, so I tried to sing it with a slight German accent. Because <laughs> I, was be like Ari? I was obsessed with Ari. So I was like, Pash on the charts and red with hunger. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I mean, it's a terrible German accent, but there was a kind of intention behind it, you know. Pash on the charts. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I've noticed, maybe from the the reunions and stuff, the Vicky Aspinall, she hasn't been a part of it, or was she ever part of the reunions? No, no. And I don't think she was a natural look at me kind of I'm on the stage person. I mean, n none of us are particularly, but I think Vicky used to get a terrible rash before we went on stage. I think it used to really. I don't know if it's to do with you know a really strict uh, musical training where you know you're going in for your exam and you know she'd obviously been trained to very well and then and with us she had to unlearn and relearn but I think some of that anxiety maybe came up because when we would perform sometimes she'd throw up you know and we yeah you know, we've even asked her recently do you want to just come and play a bit she's like I've sold my violin now I bought a car so you know she's like drawn a line under it um you never know. I said, get a cheap violin, and oh, I couldn't possibly play that. I met her in a club down in Old Soho, where they drink champagne, and it tastes just like cherry cola. Sierra Le Cola. She walked up to me and she asked me to dance. I asked her. Did you ever feel like there was any pushback, not necessarily from men in the scene, perhaps, but just from like journalists and stuff like that, like people not taking you guys seriously or mischaracterizing you? Yeah, some journalists found us completely unpalatable. But just things like, you know, Gina squirms on the sofa. You know, those words that you probably wouldn't use for a man. They're kind of slightly insulting and slightly demeaning. There's a kind of power structure that's so deeply ingrained that they have the right to treat you as though you're cute or sweet or squirmy or, you know, tickly or, you know what I mean? It's just so inbuilt into the language and the culture. I mean, like the roadies, they'd put chocolate eclair and two profiteroles or something, you know, kind of making little like, oh, they'll be freaked out by this like phallic thing. Or you know, they'd moon at us as they went past in the van, which is I also found rather funny. I, I'd like to do a remake of that on film, you know, because I love the idea of the road crew all going by mooning at us as they were going to be really shocked, you know. It was just a whole part of the culture as well as the odd crazy uh, journalist who would write something quite vile but when we played in Poland they described us as whores escaped from prison <laughs> <laughs> when my band Bratmobile got back together we had only been broken up for four years and 
I remember some of the journalists describing our first show back together and it was like oh she was gasping and holding her sides and I felt like they were trying to describe us as like over the hill or too old to be doing this or something and I thought about all the boy bands who get to age with dignity or something and how women just aren't. I also think it's that they don't have the imagination to have a language for what women do and hopefully that language is developing a lot of them aren't imaginative enough to see something and that's why Jen's book's so good is because she manages to articulate something um, about a female experience of a band of creative women right like where's the canon of women right in in any field so I guess I wanted to hear kind of what you thought about the erasure of women in the history of punk or not do you ever feel left out of the story oh well you know when when uh, the history is written it's usually by men about the bands that inspired them and and the more women writers there are that can hear and see and that female experience that's great i'm not saying that only women can write about women or only men can write about men but men have had a history of writing about men and so they feel more comfortable in that arena and so and when it comes to choosing some uh, tracks for a compilation they remember the clash the damned the pistols you know even the stranglers and you know in effect we did all come slightly later because the slits although they formed early they didn't release a record they just did the peel sessions and by the time their album came out It was post-punk time, you know, so we all get put into a kind of post-punk time, the Modettes, the Delta Five, the Raincoats and the Slits. And uh, there were various bands, but, you know, there was a big thing at the uh, British Library about 40 years of punk, and I went in there, and they had all the singles. But, you know, they'd very carefully planned it up till the end of 78, and our single came out in 79, and the Slits did that. But I I hadn't quite realized that. But I remember I went round and I yelled at everybody, how could you do this? You've not included the women. I I just don't believe. I was yelling and yelling. And and about a week later, Viv Albertine went in and scrawled on the wall. Well, she's very famous for scrawling on the wall. But my yelling attack had had no publicity whatsoever. But I did was rather embarrassed afterwards because I just yelled at everybody I could find who was involved in curating it. But, you know... Having said that, it was true that the women didn't get to release the music until a little bit later. But we were there as performers and participants and audience and, you know, helping with the buzz, the electricity. And so it did feel that we were written out at that moment, even though the intentions were great of that exhibition. The reality was that the timing made it that we weren't there and... uh, so there's always a good excuse. <laughs> right, like who decides what that time frame is going to be. And of course, like it may have taken longer for women to have the opportunities to actually record and put out their music. And it took a lot longer back then to put out music. Yeah. So they didn't have to make that narrow of a well, time frame. Well, I think frame. what we need to do in 2018 is make a women's history of punk. So last night when I was watching you perform, at some point there were just tears streaming down my face. And I thought, what? wait, why am I crying? <laughs> but I wonder if you realize the legacy that you leave and still you're still creating and doing stuff. And that also is really inspiring to me. And I don't know if people ever come up to you or you know, what they say to you, of how important it was. And what does that mean to you? Well, often it doesn't sink in, you know, because if someone offers you praise, there's a part of you that wants to bat it away and say, oh, don't be ridiculous. It's very hard to take in. And so I just kind of go, oh. (laughs) But (laughs) having said that, I was watching footage and uh, we're singing You're a Million. And it goes from Shirley describing, you know, saying how Anna was in these kind of chains. And then when she came to London and she met, said Anna, and Shirley says, and when she met Gina and when this all kind of opened up to her. And then it cuts to me and Anna going, we're a million to come. And when I watched it, it just made me cry because it was so beautiful. And so I cried myself then. And so, you know, sometimes things are powerful just because they're powerful. 
Well, Gina Birch, it has been a delight to speak with you. And thank you so much. Thank you, Alison Wolf, for having me. And if you have any last things to say... Yes, I'll, I'll just talk for another couple of hours and then um, you can do what you want with it. Bye! I'm in the Band is brought to you by Title On Air and is produced by me, Alison Wolf, And me, Jonathan Shiflett. You can find our podcast by going to title.com slash US slash on air. Or follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Real Baby Donut. Bye. I hear the music outside, and I am the music inside. Inside, inside, inside. No sound to fall in the fall. To live until my mind is still, still my mind. My life. Oh, my.